welcome to the talk. Get this. Welcome to the talk hey. to the book club, and tonight we will be discussing Chapter Four, um, January through September 1974, Wounded Knee Trials. And I'd like to introduce everyone to our special guest, um, Kevin McKiernan. Um, he's a Pulitzer Prize, uh, Pulitzer nominated journalist who began his career in 1973, and um, as an NPR radio um, reporter. And he covered the, the 71 day occupation at Wounded Knees and the Pine Ridge Reservation. So we are so honored to have him here today and have a firsthand account of, um, I personally am fangirling because I I, I watch all of your um, ben, what is it, Venmo um, videos. And it's, I just, I thank you for everything you've done to stand up for um, us as native people and, and the advocacy that you have done and it's an honor to have you here. It is. Thank you. And I would also like to thank, thank our for elders for paving the way, all of you. Yes. <laughs> so welcome. And there's a lot, there's a lot to his career. I don't, I don't know how I could highlight it all, but it is just, I can't believe you're here and it's such an honor. <laughs> really, really I'm appreciate very, it. Kimberly said, Kimberly was really nervous. She's like, I didn't expect him to say yes. <laughs> okay so let's get into it um the wounded knee trials okay now i have a couple questions about it first um as a student of law um i want to know how they overcame the jurisdictional issues and if those were addressed in court um like to me the things that are important was probably um First off, jurisdictionally, um, the 1868 um, Fort Laramie Treaty. And it, was yep. that even addressed in the courtroom? Because it wasn't really detailed in the book, but to me, that would be an issue and something that would have to become overcome jurisdictionally, uh, just out the gate. Sure, and it was decided um, at some time before the, uh, the Banks Means <laughs> trial started in St. Paul, Minnesota that the treaty issues would be handled in another federal courtroom with Judge Warren Erbaum in, uh, in uh, Council Bluffs, uh, Iowa, which is right across the river from uh, Omaha. And this, this was handled later and separately. But the treaty was often referred to, uh, but it wasn't a full-throated treaty defense. It was more of a, of a political criminal case. And um, has everyone read the, the book or yes. that chapter that you're, that you're talking oh, about? Oh yeah, several times. My copy's <laughs> packed away because I'm moving on the weekend of the fourth and it's been a while. Well, it was, I, I was a young um, public radio reporter and I had little, well, actually, I had no experience on Indian reservations. I'd never, even though I lived in Minnesota, I'd never set foot on an Indian reservation. And I would have been hard pressed even to mention the name of, of tribes in the area. I knew nothing really at all. I was, to call me um, green uh, would be an exaggeration. <laughs> So I set out. That was common and, for white people in the area, though. They, they I heard <coughs> repeatedly until the thing happened on Wounded Knee, nobody saw, heard anything about Native. Then all of a yeah. sudden, there they were. Yeah, that, and, and and I was part of that uh, invisible screen that mm -hmm. kept that from happening. So, but I had never been on a reservation i had i had never i knew nothing about treaties i had I'd never certainly seen anyone shot and so i i went out there thinking i would go for the weekend and i mostly <laughs> just took film and um, audio recordings and some of you here are old enough to remember that they used to be on reels like this oh i go <laughs> yes put them in and, yep. and actually um, there was a new invention at the time uh, called a cassette, but I was pre-cassette, so I was really <laughs> old school. I wasn't even up to the cassette era yet. So the, the equipment was very bulky for me, 
it yeah, was they really are. Cold. It was in the winter, and uh, I went out there as a you know a budding filmmaker who was asked by public radio if I would mind giving them a call when I got there because they didn't have any staff who could cover it. Yeah. And, I think my most honest report was probably the first one from the trading post in Wounded Knee where I was asked on the live air by my editor uh, in St. Paul, uh, what was going on there? And, you know, the worst thing that you can do as a reporter is to say you don't know something. Yeah. Because reporters know everything. You learn to pretend that you know everything if you yeah. don't. And I knew nothing, and so I sheepishly said, well, I really don't know. Um, the, the, the people holding Wounded Knee are saying one thing, and the government saying another, and I can't really tell what's going on, you know? So uh, that's, how, that's, that's how I started. And later, yeah. when I listened to that tape, I thought it was probably one of my uh, frankest admissions as a reporter. <laughs> Rolina was on Wounded Knee with you. I couldn't quite hear you say it again. Rulina uh, Redner was on Wounded Knee with you as a young woman. Yes, she yes. She snuck up there. Her mother didn't want her to, but she did anyways. Yes, yes. Well, as you know, there were infants there. There was a, a, a baby who was born. Uh, Pedro, we lost him this morning. And that was Mary. That was Mary's kid. Yeah. yeah, Pedro, we lost him this morning. Yeah, he what passed happened? away this morning. What, he was taken up by the car this morning. Pedro, crow dog. Yes. Yeah, I know. I was there when he was born and filmed uh, him in, when he was just an hour old. Oh, really? But what, what, what happened? He had a heart attack. Really? Oh, my yeah. goodness. Well, he's only 49 years old. I, yeah. I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, life has been hard. I mean, the life expectancy of Native people is a lot shorter than white people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that tape would mean a lot to his family if you have access to it. Sure. I mean, it's not, it's, not really, it's not really a tape, but you see it in my film. I made a film about wounded. I made a couple of films. Uh, one of them is called The Spirit of Crazy Horse. And that was back in, in uh, 1990 on the 100th anniversary of the massacre. Okay, and, and, I will look them up. And then right before the pandemic began and squashed the film I had been working on for eight years called From Wounded Knee to Standing Rock. <laughs> From um, Wounded Knee to Standing Rock. Okay, thank yeah. you. And that's available on my website. It's just my name if you're interested. Uh, you could order a DVD there and pass it around, give it to your kids, put it in a oh, stock, most definitely. stocking at Christmas or whatever, you know. Yeah, that'd be great. Out, I don't don't it. The reason I mentioned that is that, that that the film that I took of of of, of Mary Mary Ellen Moore later yeah. Mary Crow Dog was um, it's in the film that 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 happened uh, at Wounded Knee, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I met Pedro as I was reading Mary Cordog's book. And I wanted to quote her in a book I was writing and I met this Pedro. And he ended up adopting me into his Lakota tribe. He, Pedro was a great guy. Yeah. If you want to I, to I the... didn't know that was who you were talking about when you first said Have we seized up? Oh, no. there you go. You're back. Probably just a moment, just to. And, and yeah, he was to... named after Pedro Bissonnette. Yeah. I read this chapter and I got mad all over again. Uh, yeah. The murder of Pedro Bissonnette. Uh, well, in yeah. the book, it said that he knew everything about Dick Wilson and the Goon Squad. And. Uh, the BIA murdered him. Do you know anything about that? Well, I knew Pedro pretty well at, at, at Wounded Knee. And <coughs> I actually, for the first part of the occupation, 
Um, I, Mary Ellen, Pedro's mother and I were in the same uh, little trailer along yeah. with uh, four or five other Indians, including uh, Anime Aquash. And yeah. uh, so I got to know her pretty well. Oh, did and, you? And uh, remember during a firefight, her running with little Pedro and I running behind her <laughs> and running to the trailer and having a bullet come in and hit the door handle right in front of us and kind of smoke there and uh, yeah. well, it could have very well hit him or her, but did not you? Have, it may have been just a ricochet or something like that. But um, has everyone read the, the trial part? The, uh, in yeah. The, yeah. The people yes, there were the under the impression impression that yeah. all of them would have been killed. If the military had not been standing in the way, and if white people had not been there, did you get that impression? I got the impression that we're all going to be killed. Yeah. So um, it was a very difficult sense of uh, of time in Wounded Knee because um, there you only you just really went by. <coughs> the sun and the light and uh, the snow and the flowers and the changes that took place that way. But um, I had only expected to go for, for a few days. And once the government imposed the media blackout, I went in the back Excellent. way with, a, with an Indian guide uh, named Arthur Chips, who was from Wan Bli. And uh, we had the double of a time getting in there because um, our, my guide lost the, the way at a certain point and we had hit some trip flares, which were these Vietnam era flares that yep. the army had pulls, you know, stretches across paths and you, they're, very, they're very thin and you don't notice that you hit them until the last minute and it shoots a flare up over your head and then it illuminates the whole area making with this kind of orange phosphorescent and then the, uh, the uh, soldiers or the FBI um, or marshals come down in, in their Jeeps and they pinpoint the area. And so we got off course trying to evade them, but finally got into Wounded Knee and uh, that was a, a difficult part of it. But as far as the trial goes, um, I guess that's what you're, you're talking about in the, in, in the book right now. Yeah, yeah. There was well, a, it, was, it was amazing a because it was nine a nine month trial. I can think it was shut up. <laughs> sorry. Oh, shall you mute? mute. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, he wasn't. Oh, he was you. talking to his dog. <laughs> yeah, dog. <laughs> in the book, they talk a lot about Judge Nichols' his frustration <laughs> with FBI misconduct. At one point, didn't some they ask him to recuse himself? Yes, that's because true. of his prejudice against the FBI. Yeah, he was he was a uh, very anti Nixon, uh, and uh, yes, and he he brought Nixon in, into the trial quite a bit. But he was a very colorful guy, and his wife was very outspoken. Yeah, and when they would invite me to dinner during the trial which they, they had an apartment right across from the federal courthouse, which is on the Mississippi River in St. Paul. Yeah. And um, I, I could tell uh, in talking to him, I was always trying to, to drag some behind the scenes information out of him. Yeah. And um, while his wife uh, was, was answering my questions and he was mute, and he, he was he was kicking her under the table kicking, he was kicking her under the table yeah exactly <laughs> how did you know about that <laughs> or that that standard practice or what that's a couple of communication <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm just picturing it <laughs> so was there really like a competitive nature <laughs> between um, attorney um, Kunstler and Lane, I believe the name was. Yeah, like, there I was. Guess. There really, there, there really was, and there, there was um, a certain amount of showboating that went on. Uh, Mark Lane was a tremendous investigator, 
And he is the one that broke the, I, I see that the incident, um, I can remember the incident with Louis Moves Camp, who, who was yeah. Ellen Moves Camp's son and yeah. was very estranged and uh, felt that he hadn't been credited and was kicked out of the AIM house during the trial in St. Paul for drinking or other things. And yeah. then yeah. he was coached in his testimony by David Price very infamous agent, and Ron Williams, who two years later would be killed at Oglala in the shootout for which Leonard Peltier is in prison. Oh, yeah. I had made that connection. I didn't realize that, I knew that he had been, Moose Camp had been coached, but I didn't realize that it was by the, by the, the gentleman that it, or not. Well, the Ron, Ron Williams was, was just a kind of a beginner and the senior <laughs> agent was David Price. Right. And, uh, but, the way they prepared him for the trial, he didn't come on until the very end. And uh, it was so, it, I had been in the courtroom for every day of the nine month trial and, to, and nothing that he testified to had been touched on during the trial. Yeah. And there was a 10 count felony indictment against both Dennis Banks and Russell Means. And all of a sudden there was a magic witness who tied the defendants to every single count with this yeah. with this graphic testimony yeah. until the point where it was discovered that when he claimed he was a wounded knee, he had recorded a an interview on a San Francisco um, news station, and they had a copy of the tape. He wasn't even there. Yeah. So he was. Uh, so he he may have he may have. Uh, been in wounded knee for, for part of the time, but he was yeah. perjuring himself. And you asked about Judge Nickel. Judge Nickel became very angry because he saw that this witness had been prepared. Mm. Yeah. They'd taken him to this uh, Air Force base for safety, supposedly, mm. and prepared his testimony. And it was David Price who later prepared the testimony against Leonard Peltier with his false affidavits prepared and uh, signed under pressure by Myrtle Porbear. And, yeah. key, and that was the key to the extradition of Leonard Peltier. So David Price is kind of a notorious uh, agent uh, in, in this cast of characters. But I remember when uh, Ron, I'll just shortly say this, Ron Williams and David Price took took this Louis Moves Camp, the magic witness, across the river 15 or 20 miles away to River Falls, Wisconsin, where they thought nobody could get to him. Yeah. And so when night, when night fell, it was time to go to the bars for all three. And they did. And, uh, and Ron Williams, the young, the young kind of wide-eyed, uh, apple-faced agent who was really in control was really being influenced by David Price. He testified in trial afterwards that they asked how much he had to drink that night before the bad things happened. And he said, uh, <coughs> he, he admitted to at least having nine scotch and waters yeah. before, oh, she... for the night. And so later, Louis Moosecamp met a woman in the bar and wanted to go back to a motel with her. They tried to dissuade him, but finally they just went back to the hotel or it was actually a dude ranch. And the next morning it looked, um, this woman filed a complaint saying that she had been raped. Yeah. So now yeah, and that the, conveniently went away. Now the star witness who would tie <laughs> banks and means to every single crime in the, in the indictment this, this guy had been uh, sullied a little bit. So Judge Nickel wanted to know the truth of what happened. And so those two agents, David Price and Ron Williams, who would die a couple of years later, were ordered by Judge Nickel to give testimony in that federal courthouse. And um, you, they were supposed to be, be sequestered from one another so that they wouldn't repeat each other's stories. Yeah. And so David Price testified, and while David Price was on the stand testifying, an extraordinary thing happened in the courtroom for all of us to watch. And uh, William Kunstler went up to Judge Nickel and said, 
And so that's not the kind of stuff that doesn't appear in the, in the transcript, but it, it was just extraordinary for that to happen. And then- Can you repeat William that, Cumber, the names? Go ahead, sorry. Can you repeat those two names? Who walked up to the judge? William Kunstler. He he was he was uh, Dennis Banks's uh, lawyer. Yeah. Okay. And I I wanted to just well I, I wanted to tell you the the, okay. the punchline to this and then I'll. Okay. Um, so he said, and and then you looked over and we could see that the door that goes to the back where the witnesses stay had been cracked open a little bit. And there was someone looking in, listening to this testimony <laughs> and, oh my God. and violating the judge's order. Oh and that God. was Ron Williams. And, uh, and so Kunstler went like this and then he went very quietly over and he grabbed the door and he yanked it open like that. And Ron Williams fell in, it was like a slapstick <laughs> into the courtroom, and there he was. Oh, wow. so Judge Nickel had seen firsthand the shenanigans Great. that were being used, and so anyway, his testimony was was totally uh, and just the straight disrespect for the judge's order. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think they are. Then yeah. they asked the judge yeah. to recuse himself because he's prejudiced against the FBI. No. Yeah. I wanted to, um, I wanted to, throughout the whole, this whole chapter, I mean, they have AIM and they're being portrayed as a militant ex-cons. And then recently I, I listened to um, an interview that you did and well, on the Peter Collins show. And, and I was really touched by how you said that it was really a, a, a spiritual awakening for the people. And I, I just like, just the, the, the <laughs> The difference to how they were being portrayed in the media and mm -hmm. the actual movement. Did you notice a great difference between that? Well, you know, the thing that was emphasized mainly was uh, the Wild West, you know, silhouettes of, of, uh, of Indians on ponies with rifles, you know, so, you know, background, the evening sky and so forth and so on. And then the firefights, of course. And yes, I saw a lot of people wounded. There were some 18 people that I counted who were wounded, at, wounded there. And there were two who were killed. And there was a woman who died of a heart attack. And there was a marshal who was paralyzed <clears throat> for life. There were these things that were taken as highlights. But personally, for myself, my takeaway and my education being there in this kind of laboratory that all of the people were exploring about, about their history and about yeah. where they had come from. Uh, the, the big takeaway was the spiritual part of Wounded Knee. It really was, that was the core of the resistance. And that's why the real heroes of Wounded Knee were Wallace Black Elk and Leonard Crodog, because they had, they conducted, um, you know, dozens of, between the <coughs> dozens of, of uh, sweat lodges and, and other ceremonies. And that's the thing I think that went to the, to the heart of, of the resistance. And that kept people, kept people going. And that was something that couldn't be measured by the agents with their binoculars from a distance, because you really had to be up close to, to see what it was yeah. like. I got a question. Yeah, they, they uh, said that. Uh, I'm sorry, to, go ahead, Oza. I got a question, not necessarily related to this book, right? But seeing first, close and personal with these people. Like, I, so I, I idolize these people, everybody. I look up to these individuals, right? So every time I hear somebody talk about that, that's been close, gives me an opportunity to see further inside of them and really understand the essence of the men and women that fought for our rights as natives, right? So I'm just curious to you, right? Do you see a difference in the, the quality or the, the essence of, of who we are as native people then and now? If you was to do a side-by-side -side comparison, right? With the yeah. age range, what would, your, what would your stance on that be? Well, I remember when I went in the basement of the trading post in the first couple of days that I was there. This was the trading post that later burned down. 
and a new stack of boxes of books had come in. And there was a new book out called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. It just published a year or so beforehand. And it was ordered, you know, hundreds and hundreds of copies were ordered by the owners of the trading post in the hopes that they could sell them to tourists. And sitting up on top of these cartons of Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee was a young guy who was about 18 years old or so. And he was reading one of the copies. He had opened it up and across his lap, he had a rifle. And I looked at that and I said, he's learning about his own history while he's living it here. And I was just really moved by the fact that he was reaching into himself in this book to find out more about what he was doing and the decision he made to be with that small vanguard of people who were risking their life. That's intense. So, yeah, Janice Banks said, uh, when before they went there, he said, Indian people might have something to say about their lives and their destiny. Yeah. Up till then, they didn't. Uh, I've muted a few people because it's been interference. If you have something to say, please unmute yourself. And don't take it personally. <laughs> Just hit the microphone and unmute and say it. <laughs> now, I have another question about the jurisdictional thing because I'm a student of law, so that it's very important to me to kind of understand this. What about, like, how did they overcome the, the Major Crimes Act of, and, and the Civil Disobedient Act of 1968, like it, it jurisdictionally, you know? Well, the, the Major Crimes Act was passed by Congress in the 1870s. And the reason it was passed was because there was a killing on the Rosebud Reservation. Spotted Tail, who was a revered chief of the Ro Rosebud Lakota, uh, shot, um, shot and killed a man whose name was Crow Dog. And uh, no, I'm sorry, I cut the story backwards. It was Crow Dog who shot Spotted Tail. Spotted Tail was coming back from, from a delegation that went to Washington. And um, Crow Dog believed that he was a sellout and shot him and killed him. And uh, he was laying in wait for him. So the case went to trial in Deadwood, South Dakota. And in Deadwood, South Dakota, he was acquitted. And the reason he was acquitted was there was no jurisdiction. And Kimberly, your questions about jurisdiction, there was no jurisdiction of the federal government to pursue crimes on the Indian reservation. It was only up to native people to take care of themselves. And so as a result of that particular, very controversial case, Congress passed this major crimes act. At first it was two or three or four major crimes, and then it was later expanded. I think today it's something like, I don't know, 14 or 15 crimes that give the federal government, meaning the FBI in terms of prosecution, jurisdiction on in Indian country. Why on earth were they allowed to enter Pine Ridge going after someone who stole a pair of cowboy boots? You're talking now about the, the case yeah, of Yeah, I'm, I'm skipping straight ahead. And, and so the, the, the Oglala shooting, Leonard Peltier. Yeah. And, and the question is uh, why on earth were they allowed to enter that reservation because looking they have, for someone who stole a pair of cowboy boots? Well, they have jurisdiction to enter the reservation because of these enumerated crimes in now that are 14 or 15 areas. So they they can do that. Robbery is is one of those crimes. Huh. So that's the that's the short answer. Okay. Thank you. I just want to throw out the irony that I just you know I see real quick, right? How they have absolutely no problem, you know, going and doing something like that, right? Yeah. While our, our women continue to go missing, they don't do they don't do a fucking thing about it. I just want to say that's pretty cool. Yeah. Exactly. Well, while you're bringing up that, I, I didn't really get to the heart of your question. I think your question really was, what's changed since then? Is that, is that fair to say? 
Yeah, I would say that is that, that's it. Yeah, that is I want. What, what do you see? What differences do you see in this? It's just night and day to me. It's just unbelievable to see, especially what's happened in certain areas like academia, uh, to see to see that that. Uh, Indian history is being taught by Indians themselves, not the European point of view. That's just an enormous change. And to mm. see to see that sun dances when I first went to the reservation were outlawed, and to see th this incredible piece of legislation that was passed right after Wounded Knee and really because of Wounded Knee, the freedom of Indian religion. I mean, that's just a shocker in terms of change, you know, what's changed. Um, can you imagine having a law that that you 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 couldn't practice your your Catholic religion or your Jewish religion? Right. And we we so talked about that a lot at last book club, and I had pointed out that my grandmother died in 1976. She walked on, and yeah. just in 1978, we were never able to lay her, you know, to 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 our ceremony for her. And and in 1978, so that was that was huge. Like. Yeah. And then also to point out that Leonard Peltier also brought the sweat, the sweat lodge ceremony into the prison. Like that's right. That's something that's very honorable. Yeah. Um, Lenny, Lenny Foster was was involved in that and he did an awful lot for, for yeah, that. Yeah, he's going to be speaking. By the way, everybody, Amnesty International is holding um, a, a conference, a virtual conference, and Leonard is going to be one of, on the panel. And Lenny Foster, um, Le Leonard's spiritual advisor, will be just talking there. If anybody wants information on that, I'll be happy to send it to you. So, Alina um, and Sam and Annie, do you have any questions for Kevin? You guys were there. No, I wasn't there. Well, I you was... were in the area, Annie. <laughs> no. no, at that time, I was doing my first year of teaching on the faculty at Sac State. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, you weren't there. <laughs> Berlina, Sam. Annie, what were you teaching? I was teaching Native American studies, which at that point was cultural anthropology, Indians of North America, survey courses. But that you must have been a pioneer if, as you looked around. How many were there any departments of Native American studies in the country? I don't believe so, if my memory. Yes. You see Berkeley, Lehman oh, Brightman. Okay. Lehman okay. Brightman had got it started right. at UC Berkeley. I remember that. And yeah, yeah I remember when in 69 and 70, Dennis Banks and several others, including John, came by. They did a tour of college campuses to encourage us to start Native American clubs and pressure for the formalization of Native American studies as a career, as an educational program. Yeah, it was just an enormous change uh, from then to now and um... So many people to further answer your question. Uh, you know, I, I was an outsider. I don't speak for for Native people or for the government, which was in the bunkers out there, or for other reporters. But so I just really can tell you what I saw myself. But the thing that I think I took away from that is the view that people had of themselves. So that is the participants at Wounded Knee and how when Wounded Knee was over and they all fanned back to all their reservations throughout the country, they got so involved in things that they were not interested or didn't think they could make a difference doing afterwards. So people who may have been somewhat um, skittish about their heritage, and that applies only to some people, um, seemed that the arc seemed to be from that to, to a, a tremendous pride. And that's what's being deepened uh, every day in my experiences. So it was like a catalyst. It was a catalyst. You know, I yeah. use the word um, laboratory because a lot of people were exploring 
um, these ceremonies and who they were um, for the first time because it had been beaten out of them in boarding schools. It had been, um, they had been ostracized because of the beliefs. They had doubts themselves about who they were. It reminded me very much, uh, my history is, is, um, is Irish, and it reminded me very much of what my father told me in the, that when he was coming up in the, in the 20s and 30s, there were signs in New York when he looked for work that said, no Irish need apply. Now, what those people went through doesn't compare, it, it pales by comparison to what I saw in the evidence of the genocide across the country, but that has a tremendous psychological effect on people and what the big change was, and that's the question I think that's most important that you asked, is that people, well, one person just, you know, described it as, you know, being on, on one knee and to finally deciding to stand up. And when you do that, you have a different feeling about yourself. It may yeah. cost you something. It, and it did cost people in the movement a lot. Some people... Uh, lost their jobs afterwards. Uh, some people lost their marriages. Uh, some people went to prison. Some people were shot. Some people were killed. So there, it wasn't cost-free, uh, but it made a tremendous change in what people felt and felt about who they were. And that is just rippling forward. You know, it's been 49 years this month since Wounded Knee. And the ripples just keep on coming. I'm, I'm just amazed at little things that, that happen. Yeah. Yeah, people speak out now. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's by no means all right, any of what's going on out there, but people are not afraid to speak out. Yeah. And I think one of the most exciting things that I've seen to further continue on this vein is language. Um, you know, language is, is such a, a key, a core key to identity and to who people are. And there's interest in reviving the language. Uh, in so Kimberly, many, just so got the Rosetta Stone, so you got her language back. Yes, so for everybody that, um, that is interested, Rosetta Stone in two months, they're in pre-release right now. And um, Anton Truer, he's, he's developed the Ojibwe language program and that'll be available probably in March. So that's very exciting. And there's a couple of us here that are, are, are doing it. Osha and I are, are working on it in pre-release. So <laughs> we just need to practice. We need to have some Zoom classes or something. I walk around talking to myself. <laughs> you could do worse for company, right? I'm like, who's you? I mean, <laughs> I answer myself, and people are like, who is he? Who she talking to? <laughs> she says the club. bad things to people in a language they don't understand. <laughs> yeah. I, That's I, right. I, I'm just, my goal is just only to speak a deep way eventually, and you can learn my language. <laughs> hey, Kevin, before. Uh... Before before this all ends, I just you know you've given me something to think about that you just told me right. Um, so I, I want to ask you another question then. As yeah. as a man that I'm I'm from the Native communities. I'm from um the Grand Traverse Band. That's my res, right? And I see like a lot of inequalities and stuff like that, and it bothers me and it harasses me, right? And it gives me like just it makes my mouth big. It gets me into trouble sometimes. Do you think that maybe I'm looking from a place of, of privilege um, when I compare, you know, like what's going on with us now and the other, you know, other, other races or whatever, you know what I mean? Because should I, should I be accepting of what, you know, what these, what these people brought to me, what they gave to us, you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Where does where, the privilege part come in? Because you feel that you, that you have, learn things that others haven't or what do you mean exactly i feel like like because you know they they suffer like you know we're, we're talking about a book of people that that just continue to suffer we got you know at least one sister in here right that that saw it firsthand you know she may have been young but the fact is she was there and she to represent right so me in 2022 right i'm sitting here in, in a warm house you know drinking a red bull right i'm going to college um, 
that's a place of privilege for me, right? And now, like this, this way, and I'm fighting. For, I want to. The reason I'm going to college is because I want to fight for liberation of my people. I want equality. I want M and my W to end. I want them to stop trying to take our land from us. I want them to stop trying to, you know, take these um, for these lithium stuff like that. You know what I mean? Sure. It's the same struggle of uh, what and they did. It like, does not lessen no, what you are doing. At it wrong. Maybe I'm just offended for no reason. Maybe I need to look at it from you know uh, my forefathers. You know what I mean? What do you think? I think it may be even harder than it was for that small, relatively small vanguard of people who took that stand. It might be harder now to do things which are more subtle and require, I think there's still that loneliness of saying, can I make a difference? And, and you can, it just might not be as flashy as some of the things that you, that you read about in, in the books or watch, watch in the movies. Um, uh, I'll tell you that I know a lot of the days at Wounded Knee were really boring. <laughs> They were just like, you know, what's going to happen? And, and for me, it was always counting my film cassettes and wondering, should I use them up today on things which are maybe just sort of feature-like? Or shall I plan for the end when the government comes in and I need them most? And then I would have a conversation with myself. Well, how do you propose to take these wonderful pictures and escape? when they come in with the gas and the helicopters and what's your plan? And, you know, eventually I ended up burying my film and audio tapes at Wounded Knee and coming back and getting it later. But I didn't know whether I should use them up because they're, you, and I was watching people count their, their, their bullets, you know, and put them out on the table. Like I remember Milo Goings, who was Oglala doing that and counting them. And it looked to me as if he had 16 bullets left. Well, 16 bullets is something that the marshals or FBI would use on automatic and in a couple exactly. of seconds. Exactly. You know what broke my heart who, was the would... marshals killing the pony. I don't know why, but that killed me. The marshals killing the pony. Because they could. Yeah, they took a pony down. The poor thing kept trying to climb back up and they kept firing on it just because they could. Uh, Melanie, Mel 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 Melaine has her hand up. Did you want to say something? Oh, uh, good evening. I just wanted to kind of go back to what the what the question was when you kind of talk about, you know, what's happened back there all the way till kind of what's happened all the way till today, and kind of growing up, uh, you know, growing up, I we're we're all considered aim babies right in in our era so you know my brother pedro crow dog jenny crow dog there's a there's a whole slew of us all of um uh you know carter camp all, all of us kids at that time you know we all grew up uh, you know watching it seeing it uh li living it and watching everything unfold from that time all the way. And we all kind of lived together, traveled all the way over to California, ended up over in Oklahoma. You know, we were just as kids, just kind of hearing things, seeing, seeing things. And one of the things that I can always remember is always being aware of your surroundings, right? Because, because of what was going on is, is that, we knew how to shoot, shoot a gun at a very young age. We know how we knew how to secure an area. You know, we knew how to uh, make sure we, you know, we knew where the where the where the kids were, where where the women was in the houses. You know, there were certain certain clues where, if there was a meeting to happen, you know, we made our little exit. You know, so we kind of grew up in this environment but there's one thing that i can always re remember the conversation about anime and um even all the way till today at, like at no dapple we had a ochete shakoin women's society where when there's when there's protests and things that are going on there the women um 
at the forefront or behind the scenes are the ones who kind of take kind of take the hits and when i what i mean by that is that even there there was uh there was rape still happening at wounded knee there there's a silence down there at wounded knee that was happening there was um things that women never spoke of because they didn't want to ruin the movement right so they they were kind of like silenced not to report not to say anything because if you said anything back there what what was really going to happen i mean that's the whole point of wounded knee was that if if you said anything or you pressed charges nothing was happening murders were happening rapes were happening things that were happening out of control so if you take that dynamics all those years and you move up to standing rock at no dapple a lot of people don't know that i'll be writing a a, a book on all of that i wanted to wait four years and kind of discuss some of that because some of these cases are still um still being uh, resolved but like there we had like uh, over 34 rates and you guys probably never heard of that you know anytime they make any kind of movement on land um anytime they have any kind of protests um it was a little city that you know just went um grew rapidly so there was a jurisdiction problem there you were on, uh, you know, Martin County land. And who was who the Indian women going to go and report to? They sure weren't going to go to Martin County, the enemy, and make reports of rape and domestic violence and, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, sexual misconduct. They weren't going to make all these, you know, all these reports. So my point being made is, you know, the things that's happening to our women currently over 500 years, it's still happening to our women. You know, it, it's currently still happening, like right now during our, during uh, COVID, you know, our surgencies for domestic violence and sexual assault and MMIW, everything is surging. And so the protection of our, you know, the protection of our land, the protect, anytime we protect our, our land, it, it's kind of like uh, we're protecting our water our sacred elements, we're protecting our women and, and our children. And when I take a look at all the people involved, my mom was at Wounded Knee and my mom and Mary uh, were, were sisters. So that's how we all kind of grew up together. I called Mary my mom. I, you know, we, we all, and we all spiritually, we all grew up praying at, at Crodox Paradise. So we got to have a, a total insight. So when I take a look at books and that's why I came on was, I found it interesting that the conversation is still happening. I, I found it interesting that uh, there there's still uh, allies. That's how I would call you guys, you know, good allies that are still um, remembering and carrying, uh, carrying on the memories and kind of being a voice for people that some of them aren't even here anymore. You know, my dad, Carter Camp, he's, he's, he's carried on, you know, uh, Dennis Bank, you know, we all, we all called, it was like, they were our dads. They were our father figures. And we heard a lot of bad things. You know, some people don't have good things to say about Carter Camp or, or Dennis Banks or, but we got to see a different side of them. You know, our John Trudell, you know, John Trudell would, would be the guy that would at camp at Sundance time, you know, I look forward to that every year where all of all of us kids, there was like 15 of us that were all, um, you know, considered, considered the little AIM babies and we'd sit there in a circle and he, John Trudell would sing to us and uh, play, uh, he do magic tricks. And so there was another side you know, there, there, there's a whole nother side to, uh, you know, what, what's existed now and how we're going to carry, you know, how we're going to carry forward with our grandkids and kids. So I just wanted to say that little piece that I'm thankful that you guys are having this, uh, you know, this conversation and uh, bringing back, the, bringing back the light and that word awakening. That's right. 
that that spiritual awakening and awakening what this conversation is that's the exact same thing we talk about it at standing rock you know we, we created an awakening to uh, rebirth and rekindle um our our movements so thank you I, thank you <laughs> i know that the longest walk has morphed into uh in domestic violence and protector water walk. Uh, Beatrice does that. And I mean, everyone is aware of the issues and we are all trying, trying to put a stop to it. And speaking of Dennis Banks, I wanted to let you guys know that I spoke to Tatanka Banks today, his son. Uh, he moved back to, into Dennis's home because it was basically trashed. Everything was stolen, stolen, almost everything. He took nine trailers of uh, trash out of there, but he cannot leave the house without people breaking in and stealing more stuff. Uh, I'm going to start, Kim and I are going to start a nonprofit called the Dennis Banks Memorial. And I'm gonna run a GoFundMe to try to secure the bank's home. Just put in security doors and decorative iron over the windows so the kid can leave, leave the house without getting broken into. That's all on that. <laughs> Anything else you wanna add, Kevin? I really wanna thank you for coming. I have enormous respect for you. Yes. Thank you. Well, you know, it's a it's a it's a privilege for me. Uh, think about it this way. Uh, um, I got to be a hitchhiker on history. <laughs> and you've done it's a great it. way to say it. It's a great way to say it. OK, I, I also wanted to tell you all that I am. We got an email from Leonard to the book club. And so if you would just give me a moment, I'd like to read it. Um, let me bring it up on my phone here. I told him we were having a meeting today. And so he said, hello, um, I, I believe it's Mikola's, like my friends, Kathy Wakua um, Book Club. I'm hearing a lot of progress is happening with your book club. And I thank you also very much as it can only help me. I'm also hearing I will is, is doing um, great, actually awesome. And it has also helped in the spirit of Crazy Horse and Prison Writings. My books, um, my books out a lot. And as you know, the FBI, um, did everything they could to censor both of them. And Peter Matheson and Harvey Arden made sure everything in them was accurate. And as we anticipated, they would do something to censor them in the spirit it cost Vikings Press two and a half million dollars to defend. And so it had to cost um, South Dakota's Governor Bill Janklo and FBI agent David Price the same amount. And so I have to go to the next thing because I screenshotted it. Okay, and so our question was, where did they get that kind of mile, money to file these lawsuits? So the taxpayers had to pay their lawyers after eight and a half years, we won the lawsuits and um, we made new laws. Um, it, it's kind of hard for me to kind of, he's typing really fast because he doesn't have a lot of time on, on email. So I'm trying to figure out what this is saying. It says the books um, were not sold and a lot of people believed we had lost the lawsuits. And then he said, damn, I have to go. I love you all, Doksha Leonard Peltier. <laughs> so, thank you if, anybody, if that's that's to all of you so if anybody would like a copy of that email i'll be happy to forward it to you. yeah and if anybody has anything they want to say to leonard just shoot it to kimberly yeah i'll i'll, I'll, I'll okay let him, yeah i'm just so glad he's um but i just wanted to yeah i just wanted to get back the uh, kimberly and i discussed earlier today about how we were talking about how there's more interest and learning the history where bodies come from, the reservations, the history of the families, the tribes and everything. And like I was telling her, this book club, every one of us is just a piece of sand on a beach. But we are an active piece of sand that's spreading the word exactly. out. And that's what's the important thing about this. We spread the word and we get everybody, as many as we can, support learning the history the true history of this country, and also the true history behind Leonard Feltier 
And exactly. if we can't do something about getting him I was out. telling us a, a long, we are shouting in the wind. Together, maybe we can be the wind. You know, I think it starts here. You know, like yes, Dwayne said, there, there's an awakening. They're real. We're entering into a new thing. I don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. we're entering it with our eyes open. Thank you all Definitely. for coming tonight. And thank you so much, Kevin. I will be looking oh, at your yeah. website and ordering everything. Thank yeah. you, Kevin. So I just wanted Pleasure to laugh reason. a little bit, thank just real quickly. You. I know we're probably going over time, but I wanted to laugh a little bit about the whole the whole Christmas card thing and the man saying he didn't recognize his, the FBI regional director in the yeah. trial. Yeah. He, he, didn't, he lied about not recognizing his own signature and then the judge called him on it. Oh, I, yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's Great. my signature. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, well, but I guess I haven't got a Christmas card from you in years. <laughs> well, you, do you remember that, Kevin? Yes, I do. I do remember that. Uh, um, that was my office, that courtroom for those nine months. And so I went there <laughs> all day long. And But at the end of that trial, uh, there, the, there was a victory celebration in St. Paul at the um, right. Holiday Inn. Daniel Mussolini's great grandson is running for office in Italy. Japan's right wing. Go ahead. Sorry. There was a victory party at the uh, at the Holiday Inn, and there was tremendous jubilation. And the fact that that um, people had won and they saw their own story in the yeah. In the, in the acquittal of, of uh, Dennis and Russell, except I saw a woman over from a reservation in, in South Dakota over in the corner of the room all by herself and she was crying. And I, had, I didn't know her at all. And I had never seen her before, in fact. And, and I thought I knew kind of everybody who was coming to the trial. Um, I, I, I met my wife at the trial. She she came there and uh, I said, there's a new person and I have to find out who she is. And I and I did. And, and that was, you know, 45 or 50 years ago. Mm. But this woman at the victory party, I went over to her and I, I said, are you, yeah, she's crying. Are you okay? Are you okay? And, and, and you're, you're crying. And she said, I'm so happy. Oh. I'm so happy I'm Indian. Yeah. And to me, that was what it had all been about. Yeah. That must have been an intense time in your life. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> That's awesome. You met your wife there. Yeah, yeah definitely. Oh. What, made, what, it, what made her want to come to the trial? Was she a reporter? Or no, she was a student at the University of Minnesota. And she was studying, I don't know, Spanish lit, I think. And she came there and, and, and uh, it was in the dead of winter. It was below zero in Minnesota. And um, I saw her out in the corridor and I said, uh, um, you know, the, what, are, what are you doing tonight? You know, that's. <laughs> and she said, uh, well, I'm going to Mexico on a bus. And I said, <laughs> all the way. Mexico is a couple of thousand miles, you know, to, to go there. And uh, so I couldn't think of anything to say, except uh, the restaurants in St. Paul were, were, were pretty bad. And, but I did say, well, how about Mexican food? And <laughs> she was going to the real place. And so we laugh about that over, over the years. She was uh, getting ready for her 50 some hour bus ride, just going down there. She used to, have, used to live in Mexico City and she was going back. And, and uh, but uh, it was that courtroom. So yes, I have, it was an intense time for me, and also a great uh, personal time. I love that you met your wife there. That's a great story. Hey, I just have to say, I was looking like I was like re I like to like you. I really do admire your work, and so I I often um, you don't follow me on Twitter. I hope you will, but but I do repost everything you post, and uh -huh. I saw that you had a picture with the Dalai Lama. Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> my, wife, pretty... my wife has a picture with him too on the same day and I call it the hello Dolly photo. Oh, that's awesome. 
It's so great. It's so great to have you back where you belong. <laughs> Does anybody have anything else they want to say? I want to say, I wish I had known you were coming on, Kevin, because I would have prepared more questions for you. Now that we know you're accessible, may we <laughs> count on you to come back another time? Uh oh. <laughs> My own fault, right? Sure. sure. Like, I, I had invited him last minute. Whole new fan base, Kevin. <laughs> what, would, what, would your, what would your question be? Will you come back? Oh, <laughs> oh no. Lots of questions about the journalism of it. Yeah. For example. Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to share that with you. Sure. I mean, I learned my trade. I never. I. I was an English major in college, and I never took a journalism class. And my <laughs> my graduate school was the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And that's where I learned everything. And when I went to third world countries, whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan or El Salvador, Nicaragua, all these places I reported from, there was something that harkened me back to, to the reservation because that's where I first saw that how people live in third world countries. Yeah, and, uh, it really was third world in that. That's disturbing you know. because not much has changed on a lot of reservations. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was a learning experience, in other words, for me, and that's how I, I learned, uh, I learned my trade. Well, you have a whole new fan base, Kevin. Oh boy! Well, go and buy the DVD. You <laughs> <laughs> what? It's KevinMcKiernan.com. Yeah. You can find the DVD. And yeah, I, uh, I took a screenshot of it. Okay. I technically okay. cease to exist at four, so I have to leave myself notes. Okay. <laughs> well, Annie, I'm sorry. I, I was shocked when he said that he would, he actually, um, we talked today just earlier this evening, and he said, he, he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I would have let you, I would have given you a heads up, but I didn't know. Yeah. Well, well I great. I think it's really amazing that um, that you are studying Ojibwe, and um, that's I think that's the whole key to everything. You know, is to go. Well, that's one of the channels to go. You know. Yeah, I yeah. I feel really like we've all talked about this before, but um, my family they went through residential or boarding schools, Indian boarding yeah. school, and then my grand my grandmother moved to to Ventura, which is right down the road from you. And yeah. I was born in Ojai and um, at, through the relocation program. And so mm -hmm. we lost everything when our, and then my grandmother died when I was six years old. So it was like, she was our connection to that. So just being able to, to reconnect and learn my language, it's, it's, I get teary just talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm really, I'm really pleased. That's great. Okay, well then I'm gonna follow you. Oh, yay. Right. <laughs> you might get a lot of friends request for all of us. <laughs> I mean, Kimberly, I just that. made you host because I've, I've got to get ready to press. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Is there any other questions you have tonight or anything you'd like to speak out on? Now's the time. If not, it, same time in two weeks. And this was a great first meeting, I got to say. <laughs> two weeks. Thank you. We're so Good pleased. to see all of you. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Okay. Thank you all. And so same time.